Yo, good morning. Hello, everyone. Let's see. Let's get this taken off. All right. Cool. All right. Welcome to another edition of our Sunday Shorts. So this weekend ought to be a good one. I have a, a very dear friend of mine that is going to to join us and talk about F-sharp. But before that, you know, a couple of housekeeping things. If you missed the last uh, Sunday Short, it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Austin came on to help us out and show us some things that he's doing with his LA Historical app. That has been uploaded to YouTube, our YouTube channel. Please feel free to go check that out. Uh, Cryopox, good morning. Thank you for coming out. Um, yeah, so let's see. Some things we have coming up are next uh, .NET user group we'll, meeting will be in, what, two weeks? Not this Wednesday, but the next. We have Steve Smith, our, our AKA R. Dallas, coming on. He's going to be talking about um, the, his clean architecture that he worked with Microsoft to design. So I'll be really interested in that because that's actually something I've been using for a few years now. So if that's something you're interested in, how to use a, a good standard as far as architecture is concerned for your .NET applications and web APIs, that would be a really good one to tune into if you have any questions about that. So I'm gonna hang out a little bit and see some people join us. but. Before we get started, I would like to introduce our, I guess, it's, I don't really want to say speaker, but our live, um, our live cutter today, Mr. Jake. Oh, there he is. Yes, here I am. Good morning. Good morning. Why don't you, why don't you tell us about yourself? Um, I've been a, okay, through me a curveball. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry. Um. Well, I've been a .NET developer for professionally for about 10 years now. So I've done all kinds of things like all the way from web forms all the way now to Blazor. I went through Angular. So things like that, C Sharp, PB.NET, F Sharp. But outside of this realm, uh, well, before COVID, um, I used to travel the world and see things, but uh, that it was kind of messed up the past year and a half or so, but uh, you know, uh, it's basically me, I guess. Nice, nice. So for those of you who don't know, Jake and I have worked together for years on and off at various companies. So part of the reason he had to deal with Angular was my fault. And I don't know if I could ever apologize enough to him for that, but that's okay. Um, but no, so you ventured off into the F-sharp space here recently, I imagine? Yeah, well, it was on and off for a few years trying to learn. And it was really back in maybe October, November when it all kind of clicked. And one of the problems was uh, I kept trying to code like a C-sharp developer. I kept trying to search things like, which IOC container do I use for F-sharp? Well, all the answers were just pretty much, you don't do that, but they didn't say, what do you do? And so it's like, I think I was trying to sprint before I could crawl. And so that I hope to show in this stream, um, like a pathway, my pathway, I called it evolution of code. And it's my personal journey to the more functional space. So. Hopefully it'll uh, will be aligning to anyone who sees this and helpful. Awesome, awesome, cool. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I I believe you've shared some F sharp with the user group before, back when we actually had in person meetings. Yeah, that was a, two or three years ago, maybe. Yeah. And uh, it was really just I threw a bunch of F sharp at everyone and went, "Look, you can do things," but I never actually used it in a real project. Uh, I guess I should mention I actually have an F-sharp API in production right now where I work. So, I mean, uh, I learned a few things. I'm not an expert, of course. Uh, I don't have anyone teaching me how to do this. So I'm just trying to wade the waters of uh, the functional F-sharp pro uh, programming paradigm. Nice, all right, good. Well, 
I was just trying to stall a little bit to see if we can't get a few more viewers, but I'm sure people will trickle in. So um, if you're ready, I'll I'll go ahead and bring up your your notepad here, and I'm going to be quiet. If if anybody has any questions, please drop them in the chat. I'll, I'll put them up on stream. I'll I'll rudely interrupt Jake and force him to answer your questions. So why don't you go ahead and show us what you're going to be doing today? All right. So I'm going to present three different, uh, essentially, assignments or fake assignments that you might get in one of your early computer science courses. And I will start with a C sharp version and then slowly change it or refactor it to a more functional style. And then at the very end, I'll show the F sharp version. Uh, the first one's going to be a little more verbose just to make some points. So <clears throat> this one, fairly simple. The input's going to be digits 0 through 9 as an array. And the output needs to be the even numbers, but they're the text version. So for example, here, if you get 0 all the way to 9, you should just get 0, 2, 4, 6, 8 as strings. So fairly simple. And I already have the some of the code. And as you can see, I put an array of strings. And this is going to contain all the text. Here's your array of integers. And then I used a while loop. And you have uh, evens index, because you have to keep track of your index. And that's just since uh, this isn't a for loop. And this just, and then this is the other index. Actually, th this is the while index. This is to keep track of how many evens you have because at the very bottom, you have to make another array with this, the amount of elements of the index, because if you don't, you're gonna end up with nulls in your array. So if you have like the example zero through nine, this array will have 10 items in it. And at the end, the return array will need five. And that's why you need to make this new one, because in order to make an array, you have to tell it how many items are in it. So in that case, it'll be five. And when it returns, there's no nulls. OK, so I, mean, I, I wrote it like this just to show, like, this is what a beginning student would probably do. I think I would do things like this back in college. and. As you can see, inside the while loop, where the meat of the program is, you check if it's even. And then through the even numbers, you check which number it is, so it's 0. And then you just put in this temporary array <coughs> uh, the text. So and this, this is basically it. And it works. Now, let's do a little refactor. I will open up the next one. And let's change this to a for loop. Uh, and I promise this is going somewhere. Uh, I've got my other code. So as you can see, here's your while loop. I will paste in my and then you have to change this one too. So. All right. And if you notice, see a for loop and a while loop are they're interchangeable. You can do the integer or the uh, index here ends up actually just being declared inside the for loop or the for initialization. So you can say that's an improvement. Everything else is 
pretty much the same. So, <clears throat> and uh, like I mentioned before, this is somewhat like, or similar to my pathway of learning. Not everyone I know went through the same stuff. So, let me make sure I copy this. All right, so we refactored the while loops to for loops. Cool. Now, the next thing, I'm going to change everything, all of these to var. Because, oops, because why shouldn't I let the compiler figure out what variable this is? I mean, I don't have to do it. Why should I? Uh, just double check in my cheat sheet that I didn't forget. All right, next thing, these, these ifs inside, these ifs right here, we can use something, you know, called a uh, switch statement. We'll go to that. And, so now, instead of having these dangling ifs and whatnot. Now we've got simple switch statement, which essentially is just, you know, it's replacing those if else's or ifs without the else. And I mean, we would all agree right, that this is probably easier to look at if you know what a switch statement is than using, using all these ifs. I mean, this is what it's made for. And I would say the code's starting to get easier to read in a sense. Now, now I want to, I don't want to really deal with this anymore. And I, I'm going to use something called a list. So let me copy this code, put it back. Now, let's see. Now I'm going to make my my strings list. So instead of using an array, uh, using this list, I don't need to keep track of an index, and I can just add. I can just add the new text to the list of strings. Then, I don't even need this down here. I'll just return strings. But in order to get it to work, I've got to do two array because that's the assignment. They give you an array of integers and they want an array of strings. Now we've <clears throat> reduced the code of by a few lines. Let's see, so it's 39, and you go all the way from the beginning, 46. So, I mean, I think we're moving in the right direction. Now, we seem to improve things with the for loop, going from while to for. But do I really want to keep track of all these indexes for for this problem? Well, I don't have to because I can use a for loop. Instead of actually getting the index of uh, in the index, yeah. Sorry, I uh, I just realized I have a bug. Um, this should really be strings. strings. Yeah, the actual number right here. Yeah. Ooh, glad I caught that. Um, 
Yeah, I was just looking at the index. And see, and this is kind of making a point, like, you can mess up. So, a for loop will actually help that problem. Because now, I, I don't care about indexes. Why is it still red? Oh, numbers. Number. Number. So now, I mean, I know it's the number because I'm using a for loop, for each loop. I don't have to deal with indexes, so I, I seem to be getting in a better direction. Everything's a little bit more abstracted. I mean, the, the indexes, or the indexing is still in here probably somewhere when you compile down. But I mean, like every step, <clears throat> we keep abstracting away from what we had before. Now, <clears throat> all right. Now, I've got multiple uh, indentations inside of the for each loop. And you could say, I mean, for this, it's not that hard to read, but do you really want to be this far out? I mean, three isn't that bad, but the more you go, you know, like where, which, which, uh, which block am I in? So we're going to venture into link. Uh, must have pasted in the wrong spot. All right. So I can easily move this right here. I using a lambda. So now I can get rid of this if. And believe it or not, where this is a functional concept pretty much that's, I mean, link is an implementation of lambda calculus and functional programming uses lambda calculus is based on that. And uh, <clears throat> this is also another way if you don't want to do it right in the for each loop. Oops. I mean, this will this will do the same thing. But for now, I'm just going to leave it inside the for each. So now we know every single number in here is going to be even. And we reduced another line, another block. In my opinion, it's getting even clearer to understand. Now the next step is moving is moving the switch statement into its own method. I'm going to call it map to string. And instead of having this switch statement in here, I've got two lines, just map to string. I pass in the even number, and then I add the string to my list of strings. And it's a little different because I'm not breaking like I was. I'm just returning the string from whatever number was put in. And I've got another, now I've got this new exception. You should get even numbers because you're only passing this in. I mean, it's just basic error handling. Um, just trying to keep it simple for example's sake. Now, this is the spot where I was at before functional stuff started kind of clicking, and I thought this was pretty good. But I started noticing, like, why, 
like if this is a functional idea, then why do I only use, I'm, I'm only using where to get, to reduce down certain uh, collections or filtering out. And then I go back to using a loop. And I had stumbled across this by accident before I really got into functional programming where I was in the midst of it. You don't see this too often, or at least I didn't. And you can use a select statement to get rid of most of this. So to show, I'm going to say, I'm just going to do a temp variable real quick. And, oh, and I'll do select, and I'll say map to string. Now, this map to string is just this method. That was my cat. He needs to get out of here. Um, just using another lambda, I take all the... It's taking everything in the collection that this part spits out, which is an integer, and there are going to be all the even ones, and then just takes that and passes it in. But since it only... This, this method only takes in one argument, that's an integer, I can actually do a shorthand Shorthand, just the name of the method, and it will map all of it. So now, since I need an array, I'll just do to array. I can now get rid of all of this. I can say return temp. But to make it even shorter, I can just return this. All right. Now, this is fairly simple, and for some reason, for a long time, I thought this was just wrong in C-sharp or look, looking at multiple uh, link chainings, it's like, oh, you just don't do that. Well, in an object-oriented world, you normally don't because you don't have access to lambdas and you need to make things more object -y. So, yeah, it looks kind of wrong. Now, the, the next thing I haven't really used very much, or but it's called a switch expression. And this is relatively new in C Sharp, maybe uh, introduced in C Sharp 8, maybe 7, don't remember. But now, Instead of having a switch statement, there's this new thing called a switch expression. So, okay. so actually, maybe just to see the difference. All right. So your switch, switch, <laughs> switch statement. You have switch, and then you have the thing you're switching on. Switch expression is the other way around. Which, the switch, the syntax is a little different. You're matching on this. So this input, you match on here, so you get zero, zero, then it returns whatever's on the other side. So, I mean, fairly basic. And it doesn't use as much space, as many lines. Like, I don't have to write case, zero, colon, return this. I mean, I've got this, I don't want this. So, get rid of that. I'll just return, and this just returns whatever this thing spits out. All right, so I've shown a lot of C-sharp. And then even with this zoomed in, I can almost see all of it. I've already reduced this verbose while loop from 46 lines to 29. Now, now it's time to show F sharp. And I, I went into this, I, I put it at this point 
to show how similar it is. All right. And I'm actually going to type this one out to show like the flow of actually typing. So I'm going to call it, there are all the methods that are called run, in case I didn't mention that. So I'm just going to make a function, and I'll explain the syntax in a second. So function run, use let, here's the function name, here's the, the argument, I'm going to call numbers. It's equal to, I'm going to do number, numbers, and then I'm going to do array dot filter. And I'm going to do something that looks really similar to a blink lambda. And array dot map. Oh, but I do not have the map function. So let me just go up here and say map. Okay. Number, and I say match number with zero, zero, two, two. And uh, actually, I'll just paste the rest of this. You get the point. Just go down. Imagine I just type that. I just tap down. I do a ray map. I say map to string. We're done. And as you can see, it's only 15 lines long. Uh, there are no using statements, or they're, they're used the keyword open in F sharp, which it's this. But everything here is built into the language. All right, so here's, it took uh, like what, almost 25 minutes or so to get to F sharp. Now, you can do a lot of damage just knowing these basic, uh, this basic syntax. Uh, I'll type that out since I can't zoom in. I hover over so everyone can see it. It says val run numbers. All right, this, this describes pretty much the variables, functions, uh, syntax. So what it's saying is this function is called run, and this is its signature. It takes in something, an argument called numbers. It is of type integer array. And then this little thing says it's a function, so it returns a string with a, an array of strings. That's what this little <coughs> symbol means. And it uses a type inference for all of this. Because as, as you can see, I didn't actually tell it what numbers is. You can by doing something like this. But most of the time, you don't. And then this little symbol is a pipe symbol. So it will take this, whatever this, this thing returns, which will be the array of integers, and it will pass it into the last argument of the next function. And then this is the function array.filter. It takes in a function, which this is a function, it's an even, uh, check your even function. And then it takes in a collection or an integer, an array of something. In this case, it is an array of integers as the last, it's the last one. So, I, I'm, yeah, so that works too. But that's normally not the syntax. And the reason being is if you had to type that out, like you can't read or you, it's the flow. And that's something I think it's, it's hard to wrap your head around because you can see, oh, I've got numbers. It filters by something, which is get even. And then I do map, which 
map, a random map is the same as filter, as in it takes a collection of something, or an array of something, and it puts it at the very end of the argument list after the first argument is a function. And it, it is kind of confusing at first, and it's just something you have to like actually work on and understand yourself. I mean, it took me forever to get this. Um, and then this thing over here, this is, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this one out. So val map to string, the signature, I should say, number and integer. So now you can see this is a function that takes in an integer and it sends out a string. Number is integer, it goes through a pattern match, which looks very similar to the switch expression. And that's, I mean, this it's basically implementing the pattern match. Picks in the number, and then it matches on these integers, and it spits out something with this little syntax. And yeah, the, this I know that this pattern matching is a lot more powerful. There's a lot more things it can do. Uh, I've got I think I have maybe one or two more examples. Um, it's not exactly the same as a switch expression <clears throat> or a switch statement. Uh, it's got a little bit more functionality. So um, <clears throat> yeah, you, you just believe me that there's more things that it does. All right. All right, so real quick, I just want to I want to do a slight recap. So basically what you just walked us through is I'm going to try to sum it up kind of concisely is leveraging functional ideas to reduce the amount of code that you were writing in C# -sharp until eventually you just kind of brought it straight into the functional programming language where these ideas are just natively built in. So instead of Array.filter and array.map inside C sharp, we wow. use link and we use the where clause instead of filter and we use select instead of map in order to to kind of shorthand what we were doing with the for each loops and the for loops and the, the while loops. So we already saw the code quality increase um, in several different ways, moving away from the while to the for to the for each, and where I mean, you found the bug yourself in the for each where you know, you're not specifically calling out an index and you don't have to worry about trying to access things that aren't in the array because you know you're only accessing things inside the list because you're looping on the list itself. So yeah. now you brought us full circle to where essentially those principles originated. Yeah, like, like you can think of it as where object-oriented comes from. I think it's uh, what paradigm is it? Uh, I forgot the name. Procedural, iterative. It's one. It's one. It's not declarative. Where functional comes from declarative. What's happening is C sharp and object oriented attacks problems from this direction, and F sharp starts over here from this direction. So it's it's two sides of the same coin. And over the years, with Link and different improvements in C sharp, we've. Uh, functional ideas have been sneaking in and we haven't really noticed. And uh, to the point of looping, this right here and this, if you look at the IL code that it produces, there, it actually produces a loop itself underneath. We're just, in a sense, abstracting uh, concepts. I think you, you, you use different words, but basically, yeah, mm -hmm. it's taking a concept and then shortening it and just assuming it'll happen. Mm -hmm. somewhere else it's already been solved so i don't have to worry about it nice yeah so yeah like you, the point that you made the il it essentially they're going to compile down to something similar we just with the functional programming language like you said the um the ideas are just inherent in here you're yeah. not having to have to address it with different libraries it's just built into the language with your filters and your maps because that's like you said it, it comes from a different direction to attack the problems so all right, well, I'll leave you alone. Keep going. All right. Focus on tabs. All right. So I'm going to go to the next assignment. And it's, you're going to have uh, some shapes and just calculate the perimeter of some shapes. And 
I did not list out the shapes I have. So I'll start a very objecty way. And I'm just looking. All right, so I've got a circle, got a rectangle, and I've got a square. And yeah, and I put everything in one class just, just to get the line count. Normally, this would be in another file. This would be in another file. I just did it just to show the count. Um, so I have an interface called iShape. I need to calculate perimeter. And so each, each class will have square. And I'm going to implement the interface and calculate perimeter. And this way, you know, you've got this variable side, which is encapsulated. It's private. The only way to set the side is through the constructor. Very object. Uh, so you can ask, you know, I want calculate perimeter. And I, I think, I mean, I kind of forgot about this because over the years, because I, I don't, the last time I really coded like this was in college. Um, not many places I've worked at actually go down this route for some reason. And then you got rectangle, you got your height, length, same thing. Calculate perimeter, it's different because, you know, it's rectangle and that's what interface is for. You uh, make a blueprint of what you want to do and then you have circle. And I know it's not a perimeter, it's a uh, circumference, but, you know, come at me, um, linguists or mathematicians. Yeah, I'm going to call it perimeter. So <clears throat> here's the formula for that. And here's just a basic thing. I made a triangle, a square with the, with the uh, constructors. I make a list of shapes and then just, I just loop through it. Um, calculating perimeter and it spits out just a collection of the perimeters. And so line count here is 57. And that's the more objecty way to do it. Then there's the strategy pattern that's very popular. And this might not be the best solution for this, but I'm just using it as an example. So for this one, we'll have the perimeter calculation strategy. And all you do is you execute, because that's what you do. Then you have your different strategies that you're going to implement. So this is the square perimeter calculation strategy. You can see it's getting a little more verbose. And in order to do this, I set it up by passing in a square. It's a square, and then I execute, and I do what's on the square, just side. And also, I implement, uh, they're all I shape. I guess to put them in a collection. Yeah, that's what I did. So I've got all the different strategies. Got a rectangle, got a circle, got the same, uh, you know, formulas. But in order to get this to work, uh, let's, Uh, anyway, so just real quick, just for the, I know I keep interrupting you, but just to, to clarify, I, so you're using the strategy to actually do the calculation on the shapes themselves instead of having the shapes themselves perform the calculation, right? Yeah. Just so that, for example, I mean, like that, that's a thing that, I mean, I, I've done work and mm -hmm. I, see, I see around, you know, having, having strategies that just have methods on them. And then you just have your classes that just have uh, getters and setters on the properties. That's right. So that way, so to, to kind of translate it to some of the, the stuff that people would typically do in work or see is, you know, your, your shapes would be like your Poco entity or something like that. That's, that's very anemic that doesn't actually have any functionality on it. So we're going to implement these strategies to calculate the, the, the parameter or the, what is it? The, the circumferences or the perimeter. perimeter. Yeah. That on these objects in order, instead of having them do it themselves. So this is just a different pattern that we use to accomplish the same thing that we did in the previous example. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's wrong. Like I'm not saying, I mean, these are just different ways of doing things and things that I've learned. And this may not be the way everyone else does it. I mean, it, it's essentially, you know, 
Similar. It's another option. Yeah. All right. I don't know what my cat wants. You can go away. I'll deal with you later. It wouldn't be the internet without a cat appearing. I don't know where mine is. Mine's locked out of the room. So. Okay, yeah. Well, Visual Studio kind of bugged out for a second. So I, I that was, it was trying to show this little item thing, but then it stopped me from editing or highlighting. But anyway, just I just shorthand, um, I've got my list, and then I add this factory dot strategy dot execute. So in this scenario, I have to have a strategy. I use the switch expression just for fun. I pass in what type of shape. It figures out, hey, which thing are you? And then I return the new strategy, which is what a factory does. It gives you a new object. So then, as you can see, then I just did dot execute. I mean, basically it and with all of this code without the example run part we're at 76 lines versus like we, we've added lines and i mean it makes me question like i mean there are reasons to use the strategy pattern but you are making more code and there would be more files and when you have uh, like 10 strategies, is that, is that really easy to deal with? I mean, it gets to a point where, I mean, it's not wrong. It's just, how do you organize this? Now, I'm not going to type out the F sharp version of this. I already have it, but I've got some more F sharp things to do, new things. It's called like a, it's called a type. It looks similar to json -y kind of, uh, like JSON. Um, and this is not an object. It's not a class. This is literally saying there's data, and it looks like this shape. That's really all it is. So you can't put functions on it. You can't. It's just, and it's immutable. You cannot change it once you set it. It is not an object. But you can think of it almost. Uh, if, like a POCO entity where you just, you have basic getters and setters. I mean, you can, these are mutable by default in C sharp, but records are not. So similar. Now, I called this I shape. It's not an interface. I just did it to relate it to this interface. And it's, it's kind of like in reverse. It's actually a discriminated union reverse. Uh, what I'm using it right now, kind of reverse of a, an interface. I'm saying that I've got different names in the discriminated union square. And I'm saying this square is of type square. And it's the same name, but this square is part of the discriminated union. This part of the record. And to... Uh, keep with the name convention, I call it strategy here. It takes in a shape of a discriminated union. You use your pattern match, which is the same, let me bring it up. It's the same syntax as this. Match something with, and then you got your, your pipe symbol, and you pick it. So this, it's a discriminated union of shape. It's this type, and you gotta put a variable, which this, it's, you can't see it, maybe because it's kind of tiny, but it says, let me just put it, val, val, s square. And this square is actually this green color, telling you it's of that record type. It is, so the pattern matching patches on the discriminated union type, and then it, it's, it's kind of like a cast, I guess, if you think about it that way. And then here's my formula. For a square, it's s dot side times four. And then rectangle, circle, you got all your functions. And I know these are inline functions. And you can be like, let square, 
side equals uh, side. And if you wanted, if the if it was too long, I mean that'll work too. Should have worked. Uh, side. Okay. So I'm just tapping into the variable or the. It's not really a variable, but it's on the. That's what it's what that is. I forgot what these things are called, but it's part of the record. But since they were so short, I could just put them like this. Uh, that's odd. I don't remember what. Mm -hmm. does, it, does it need to be capitalized? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Case does matter. And F sharp as well. Okay, so here's the run function just to prove that works. So you have rectangle, uh, and this is how you initialize it. It looks kind of like a constructor. So this rectangle is actually, as you see, highlighted is this discriminated union type, and then this is how you initialize a record. Let me temp rectangle just to show. And this looks similar to like JavaScript, I guess. And as you see, I'm not actually telling this that it is a rectangle record. It uses a uh, type inference, it looks up and finds a match. And that's part, part of the pattern matching thing of uh, F sharp, is it does this too. It's not just writing code, like I don't have to tell it explicitly, this is a rectangle, it already knows. Now sometimes it doesn't, it might find something similar, and sometimes you have to coerce it, that's why this is here, but most of the time you don't. Um, so I'll get rid of that. So here's a rectangle, here's a square, here's a circle. Oh. So I have a question. Yes. Have you ever done that in a project where you had to go back and coerce it cool whatever it because it found multiple similar things and it started freaking out on you after you added something new yeah um it was with mappings uh between yeah i might i might get on stream and talk about how i structure stuff uh in the chart projects but I had a record type that went to a database that matched a date, like an entity, a database table. And then I needed to map it to a DTO for the business logic to separate the business from the mm -hmm. repository. And there were the same exact uh, record types like they matched. So the mapper didn't know what it was mapping. It, it, it picked the same one. So I had to tell it like, no, you need to map this specific one to here in the function. So like, it happens, mm -hmm. and it's not bad that it does. It's just you know yeah. a way of life. It's it's kind of neat that it will will infer for you for mm -hmm. the most part, and then you know every once in a while it needs a little bit of course correction. But that's neat. Yeah. That's nice. Oh, I didn't mention uh, let also initializes variables, and I put variables in air quotes because they're not variables. They do not vary. You cannot change them once they're set. The only way to get a new thing, I mean, that, that's a hard concept, and I kept getting blasted with that when I was trying to learn functional. But it's just, you send in a, you call a method, and then it returns something as well. You always have to return something. I don't think I mentioned that, but that's how you get around the immutability. You really like, like, I'll do it real quick. Side course, side correction. Uh, if you do like let add to, like add uh, to, so I would do a x plus two. Um, uh, wait, I totally forgot what I was talking about. How you always had to return something? Right. Okay. <laughs> um, so this variable x would be you would pass in you know the number one. And then you have to return something. 
So then it's one plus two. So this variable, in a sense, will never change. Like we could change it to, you know, like, uh, let's do square. And, oops, wait, square. Uh, it doesn't know what it is right now. So let me reverse it. I did side equals square dot. Okay, now it knows it's a square because I put dot side, it matched up here, and then this is actually just to put it val or val add to um, square. Square, square. Um, so this is saying you have a variable square. It takes in a square, and it actually, it's it's this green. So it's a record, and it spits out a square. So I can be like side plus two. So now I pass in a square. It's a, it's a double. Pass in a square. And then I added two to the side. So now I have two squares. You have the square that you passed in. I can do it here. That square two equal add two square. Oh, that's right. It's because this is a this is a discriminated union discriminated union i want to enunciate that i think i don't use these very often i haven't had to use them so i'll just do square one like I said, I'm not an expert at this. I'm still learning. Uh, all right. So this square and this square are different. So in a sense, you change the square because you probably won't use this square anymore. You will use the new square. But you have two squares. And then it lets you, I don't, I don't like this feature. You can do this. You just change what this thing means. It's really two different squares. This square here has a side of three, and this square will have a side of four. Um, that's one thing I don't like about F sharp. I'm like, I don't know why they put that feature in there, but anyway. Back to what I was doing. Anyway, fun, fun with F sharp. Um, okay, so we got our discriminated union items. And then this is some funky syntax to make an array. That's all it is. Uh, it's this inside the brackets, and then you separate by semicolons. Then I pipe it into a map, which pipes into this function. And then it returns a collection of doubles. That are the parameters. So. I hope this kind of made sense. Uh, and just to point out, 27 lines for the actual code that to make this run versus uh, for the strategy one, 73, for the object-oriented one, 57. And you're, you're just going to be writing less code. And, and I know a lot of this is just like curly braces, but um, I mean, that's part of it. I mean, like you actually you have to scan through it and your brain has to ignore, mentally ignore these things. And to point out too, I don't think I mentioned tabs matter in, uh, in uh, F sharp. Like this is a block of code. I know some people don't like that, but some people I don't know, like their curly braces. 
but literally every code I've seen that's actually formatted, we're doing the same thing. We're just not being forced by the compiler. Every single block has, you know, it's tabbed over. So, I mean, it's really not that big of a deal if you think of it that way. I mean, every, every loop you tab over. So, I mean, that, that really shouldn't be a huge hurdle to get, to get by. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, assignment two. I've got one more. Nice, nice. So just, again, just a, a quick little recap. So what we started off with was the objects calculating their parameter. Yeah, whatever. The size of their I can't think of, huh? perimeter. Perimeter. I keep getting parameter and perimeter. All right, perimeters on themselves. Next, we wanted to actually do something, I guess, almost like it's a little bit more functional, right? Where it's actually taking in the object and then you have a function that calculates the perimeter but we do that using the factoring strategy pattern and our patterns and then next we actually kind of implement our own factory and strategy pattern inside f sharp using functions so we're just passing in functions and records in order to actually perform these calculations and again it's like you're not you don't need the additional the additional classes and interfaces and stuff in order to to accomplish that so awesome awesome yeah let's let's go ahead and see if we can knock out uh assignment number three now and that one's a lot shorter and to make a point about the strategy pattern if you search how do i implement strategy pattern in f sharp you're not really going to get good results because it's it's kind of the thing like if you learn functional first you go well you know it is known you just do this like it they didn't really name it because it's just inherent in the way you code. So it, it's just, I mean, that's what I've struggled with is trying to find things. And I got, you know, all kinds of names and things like monads and monoids and functors. And it's like, and I'm trying not to use those terms because I just want, you just need to get started. And I guess this is the point, like, it's one of those, like, just believe that it works and there's names for it. Don't worry about it. It's kind of like, a, you know, like this thing, what are these when you're learning? You're like, D -d 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 it doesn't matter. Just put this and this starts your program. Um, I think someone's mowing their dress. All right, function or not function? Um, assignment three. All right, translate numbers one to ten between English, Spanish, French, German, and Italian. Like just the text or whatever. Uh, simple, simple thing. This one is in multiple files. Yeah, better do this quick. All right, so I've got enums. That's how I implement it. There's, I don't think I put actually any strings. It's just enums, uh, get the point. One through 10, you know, French, whatever that is. You got German, Spanish, you, you get the point. Uh, I've got the English translate from English. So you have an English number, you pass in the enum, you have a switch expression, because I like them. You got one, spits out uh, the Spanish uh, enum, or enum, however you pronounce that. You got your English to German, English to French, English to Italian. All right. Um, now, you start, if you start with English and you've translated them all, I don't really want to like do every single one again like that. And oh, I have to do it for Spanish to English. So now this one is in reverse of the English to Spanish. Is, is the volume, can, can I still be heard or? Yeah, I could, I could still hear you. Uh, it's so. like, all right, yeah, there's a little patch of grass in my neighbor's mo. Nice. <laughs> okay, he, he's gone. All right, all right. Awesome. All right, so this is a thing called composition. Uh, I mean, you hear like composition over inheritance. Normally, I think you see it like this. Uh, and then, Mm 
English. And normally, right. So normally you write like that because it's easier to read. But essentially, you're doing this. And the reason why we don't do this, I mean, it's valid, but it's because everything's in reverse. You return what? Uh, I'm passing in number into Spanish to English, that function or method, and it's fitting out something that's being passed immediately in to the next one. Now, I'm just, I just wanted to show off actually with assignment three, uh, the idea of composition in uh, F sharp. So, and uh, here's, here's another discriminated union. Uh, you don't have to tell it what type it is. I mean, it, it's kind of like a makeshift uh, enum. It's not an enum. It's a discriminate, discriminated union. And they, they don't have any numbers or anything associated to it. It's just this is what it is. Uh, I don't really know how to explain them very well because I don't really understand them 100%. And I could be using them wrong. Who knows? Uh, that's why uh, we continuously learn. All right. So I've got the functional translate from English module, so English to Spanish. You got your number, you match, your nice pattern matching again. You got your discriminated union. It returns the Spanish discriminated union. And this is this is a thing where it it doesn't it doesn't there's there's actually two Unos. Italian uses Uno as well as a number. So I actually had to tell it. It's the module Spanish.uno, because I'm opening the numbers module. All right, now I'll go to the Spanish one, Spanish to English. It's in reverse, just like the other one. But we got this nice little syntax where you use composition, because I already have you know the Spanish to English, so I'm doing Spanish to German. Spanish to English, and then I need to go English to German. So the way this works is you have to take a function that um, <clears throat> the output variable of this one, or the output yeah, matches the input of this one. And it can only have one, uh, like you can't have multiples, like you only like one argument, and the way you get around that is using the tuple. And uh, I didn't really make an example. I didn't make an example for that, but just believe me. And then, because uh, <laughs> um, I think uh, I've done more than enough trying to just explain the functional concepts, and it might overload some people. Now you might ask, why do I need this composition? Why does this matter? Well, what I use it for is. I'm able to bake in a repository call in the code I have at work. Uh, like, imagine if this was a repository call to some database, and I and it takes some like an ID in, and then you want to map it, and you want to use some mapper because you need to map it to a DTO. Well, now you just created a new um, function, and then you can pass that to the business logic. And the business logic has no idea that it's calling a database because it just needs to match the uh, signatures. And <clears throat> probably the very last thing I talk about, but this signature is Spanish to German. Gotta hurry up before the wee beater. Spanish to English. Oops. English. And, wait. Not English. Ugh. German. So I just made a new function that says Spanish to German. Hey, that's it's Spanish to English. That, that's what this one is Spanish to English. And then this one is English to German. Do that real quick. I'll have 12 into it. Uh, it looks like this. So, and that's what that one is. So, when you look at it all together, 
When you have the two, you have Spanish to English, then English to German. And then that's what makes up Spanish to German. It, it pretty much hides this middle part. And you get that. And uh, that's another concept that was kind of difficult to understand because I didn't know where to use it. But it's basically just making, just gluing two other functions together to make a new function. It's like, it's like maximizing reusability. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, and, and wait, one more, for one more, like look, 23 lines, 44. So every time we're using less lines, which should be, you know, anyone should like that. Well, if you're a consultant, you get paid by lines of code, then F sharp is not the language for you uh, is what yeah. I'm here. So. De definitely not. Use a, like a VB or something. Yeah, something Cobol. verbose. COBOL. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that's all the things I wanted to show. Nice. That's awesome. No, I think that was a really good overview of how to get from C sharp to to F sharp. That, that's awesome. We really appreciate you coming on and doing that for us. Um, let's see. I don't know if we have any questions that we can take. If not, um, you know, we're going, we're going to, we're going to publish this out to, to YouTube, hopefully later this afternoon. Depends on how lazy I'm going to be. Um, it's a Memorial day weekend. So I hope everybody's out enjoying themselves. So, yeah, no, thanks again, Jake, for coming on. Uh, thanks to everyone who showed up and watched. Thanks for everybody who's watching on YouTube. Uh, I hope y'all got something from this. If you want to come on and share any languages or anything whatsoever, you know, please reach out. This is a community channel. It's for the community to to showcase their work, showcase what they're learning. So, yeah, any 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 parting words? Um, I, I do have this code on GitHub. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, let me double check. Uh, I changed my GitHub account name to something a little more professional. Well, that's no fun. Uh, let me so, find it. Yeah, if you can get it, we'll, we'll link it in the chat. Um, I'll make sure to link it in the descriptions. Uh, I put it in whatever chat I have. Okay, I see it. I can see it. I got it. I will copy it and paste it in there. So chat, everybody can see it. And we're going to be fancy. There is the GitHub repository. If you're interested, be sure to go and check that out. Um, it looks like a nice project that you can actually pull down and start looking at some good concepts for functional programming with. So we do appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, but yeah, so we'll be back in not next week, but the week after. We do this every other week. I'm going to probably jump back on the Blazor and Azure Function stuff unless something else comes up to share. Uh, and what, a little over a week, we'll have our Dallas Steve Smith, um, whatever, how, whatever you want to call him, he's be sharing his clean architecture in. Again, thanks to Jake for coming and hang out with us. Um, if you want to just hang out for a little bit longer, I'm going to put up a little screen and end the broadcast. Oh, it looks like I may be lagging, having internet issues. Anyway, until next time, everybody, thanks for hanging out.